as we were discussing, Homo sapiens are a kind of, uh, as we've talked about, a relict species. We are a the leftovers or the subset of a larger range of variation, the Neanderthals and maybe Denisovans and some other Homo naledi and some other archaic, what they call archaic humans, uh, were around before, but eventually Homo sapiens would become the one bipedal interbreeding species throughout the world, which again is a subset of this wider variation. So from the very beginning, from our bipedal origins, we were able to walk further distances and to move and to mate with each other and to interbreed. And all of these populations as we've been moving out have always been interacting and interbreeding and, and uh, moving not just outward, but back and forth too. So we have to, you know, this is how people moved, moved expanded from Africa, but people were always traveling back and forth as well. And lots of people are, are in Africa as well. So when we talk about these kinds of human dispersals, we have to keep all of those things in mind. The hunting and gathering techniques were the ways in which people spread all over the place and adapted their toolkit, developed their toolkit in all kinds of different climates from the Arctic to the tropics and all through the continent of Australia. Incredible achievements. So Homo sapiens coming out and interacting, interbreeding with different groups, crossing the Wallace geo biogeographic boundary here, which is some deep sea water, Incredible achievement to populate the continent of Australia would not come back into contact with the, the others for about 50,000 years. So, uh, you know, we could talk about the cultural and, and artistic achievements in Australia and their hunting and gathering techniques. Also, we could talk about the, uh, the eventual population of the, uh, of the uh, Polynesian islands and into the Pacific. Again, incredible human achievement there to be able to sail out uh, and, and never come back into different islands all the way out to Easter Island. And so we see here that, that these groups developed and they develop a series of, of clinal variations uh, and, and different mixings and matchings as we go along. The one, one of the puzzles or mysteries you might say, uh, is how people, homo sapiens populated, how and when people populated uh, the Americas, North and South America. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about today because we are getting more and more evidence on, on when and where and how this occurred. Um, I first want to say that this is, this is only a puzzle for people who then met up uh, later for Europeans and others coming back into contact with the Americas. It was not a puzzle or a mystery for the people who are living in the Americas. They were fine. They were not puzzled about who they were, or how they got there. Uh, they were they were all happy, but it was a puzzle for people who had uh, who who when the Europeans showed up, they didn't know what was going on. They didn't know how people were had gotten there, and so this is where we get some one of our the biggest misnaming perhaps in all of human history is when Columbus shows up and does not know where he is, and thinks he is somewhere off the coast of. India, <laughs> and so calls the people in the Americas Indians, and a, a name that would stick in various languages for a long time. There are some people who have now sort of appropriated that term and use it for themselves as a self-designation. I would be 
I would say I'd, I'd just be careful with the term. If somebody is using it for themselves, that's different than if you're using it for someone else. So some people have appropriated in the same way that um, a term, uh, a, a term like queer, for example, which was once or is, was once considered insulting, has been appropriated by some people as a designation of, of something they, they want to be. So in some ways that's possible. Um, this term appeared in my son's middle school textbook and made me, <laughs> it's with the paleo Indians, which is, affixes this sort of stone age idea to the people who, who were first coming. And I don't know, I just get this weird, weird image in my head from that term. So I would especially avoid that term. Then later on, they, they told him that, the, no, these were actually the first Americans, which I guess is a better term, first Americans than Paleo-Indians. But for me, it just gave me these images of people running across with an American flag and waving it at me as they were coming across. So, I mean, again, here, probably the terms that are we know the most are Native Americans and we can go with that one. But I guess I would just, we should call our attention to the, there is a bit of irony here in that the Americas, of course, are named for Amerigo Vespucci. Uh, Columbus actually didn't live long enough to see the Americas named, but uh, they're named for someone who long post-dated the arrival of people in this territory. So when we say Native Americans, we're still very much using this, uh, this designation. In, especially in parts of Canada, um, the term First Nations has, has kind of come up as an alternative designation, which again gets us this point that people were here they were politically organized. They had different forms of organization. And so before there was an America, before there was a state, before there was a United States or a Canada, there were uh, political and uh, social groupings here. Uh, so this term you hear sometimes more, like I said, uh, I've heard it most uh, used in Canadians. Uh, Jennifer Raff uses the term first peoples which I also like more than, uh, than some other terms, in part because First Nations implies that people were organized in terms of nationality, which is not something that they may have necessarily been thinking about. They had alternative political organizations, some of which may seem like what we know of as nations, but nations are actually something that, as we'll talk about, comes up uh, fairly, uh, fairly late, uh, they may have had alternative views about how to politically organize themselves, not as a national territory. They may have not been patriots. Um, the term indigenous is also something that has been used throughout uh, both uh, the United or the North America and South America, Latin America, indigenous. Um, seen as kind of a perhaps a more positive designation um, of, of people. And so some people prefer uh, this kind of term as a general term. I think a lot of people prefer the name of their group. Um, Raf talks about, for example, the Kootenai uh, group. Um, and with that being said, I would say that some of these names, it wasn't just Columbus, it was other, other explorers or other people who would encounter people and give them names that they didn't even recognize themselves. So there's, a, there's an article I may have you read about uh, a group that has been known as the Pima in, in Arizona. And as the author says, you know, they they basically, these explorers showed up and asked them who they were, and their reply was P-E-M-A, which meant, I don't understand what you're saying, or what? And so a whole group of people got called the what. 
and you know, not very, you know. So when we name people, or <laughs> we should be careful of naming people. We should we should ask them what they what they want to be called and try to understand what they're saying before we slap names of them. And this is part of a general plea that applies both to us as people and to anthropologists, to scientists. When we are working with or studying with other people, we should study with them and try and figure out what their concerns are, what they want to do, rather than trying to put people under a microscope or dig up their stuff. And uh, for the people who have lived who in the Americas, they of course were subjected to some of the worst and most genocidal treatments. They've constantly had their bones dug up, artifacts ransacked, and it persists uh, to this day in terms of those DNA tests and ancestry tests that we talked about, because people are very quick to try and uh, give people a test and say if they're, and try to tell them that they're not, they're not indigenous or they're not Native American enough. Other people will try and take a test and start claiming that all of a sudden they are Cherokee or something. Uh, so Native Indigenous peoples have been sus rightly suspicious of people doing, going in and getting genetic stuff. And so uh, Jennifer Raff's uh, book, which came out this year, and this article is an excerpt from it, is really groundbreaking in that one, she has a lot of genetic evidence, which has been difficult to acquire. And two, she's very receptive and very attentive to some of the issues that this raises and our need to understand uh, people's oral traditions and who they think of themselves and that science should work with that, not supplant it. So what we're getting is a, there's still gonna be some really interesting things to find. It's not all wrapped up in sheets. At the end of the article talks about some of the interesting things, lots of stuff that is still out there for those of you who are interested in this kind of work. But what we are pretty clear about is that the people who populated the Americas began with some really interesting stuff that was happening in what is now Siberia, stayed for a decent amount of time, in uh, a place that is called Beringia and would have been a kind of refuge during some very difficult climate periods. Again, people remained in Siberia and remained in Beringia. They weren't just running across and, and leaving. There were people who, who were there. So they, they were there for a long time. And then at about probably around 15,000 years ago, there was then a fairly rapid movement of peoples, most likely along the coast using boats or using sea craft to move rather quickly throughout the Americas. And we know this because people show up, you know, here we have sites that are about 10,000 years old, and here we have sites that are about 10,000 years old. So how did people get to these places? It seems like the route was by following the coast uh, and then speculative that there was a, you know, people started following this coastline at the Isthmus of Panama and down the coast here so that we have, oh, and by the way, just so you know where those Ecuadorian ceramics are, they're on the the Ecuadorian coast, the next article we read. So this is, a, again, a, a, a fairly clear picture of what happened and when, which is about 15,000 years ago. Uh, there's this uh, coastal route thing. I say this because there's been a lot of weird ideas about how people got here. So the, nobody came from Mars. They were not helped by alien technology. They didn't People did not come down and tell people how to build pyramids and stuff in the Maya. So they didn't come from outer space. Importantly, they were not from Europe. And again, there are some, there's been a lot of 
archaeologists and other weird people who want to make a claim that somehow people, Native Americans, got here from Europe, Iceland, I don't know where. Um, there may have been some contacts, but in terms of the bulk of the population, uh, there, is, there is not genetic nor archaeological evidence that, there, that this area was originally populated by people from Europe. I guess this is, you know, <laughs> they weren't from Egypt. They weren't the lost tribes of Israel. I know, it sounds weird, but some people have thought these things. Also, and perhaps, perhaps more realistically importantly, there was a what was called the Clovis First Hypothesis. And it was named for Clovis, New Mexico, uh, where some very sophisticated hunting uh, projectiles were found. And the idea was, which basically still I think is around in a lot of your middle school ideas, is that these big game hunters were charging across the ice, running down mammoth all the way through, just kept following the mammoths down. And so the Clovis first hypothesis was basically that the, the Americas were populated by big game hunters. And again, you can see a lot of the stereotypes about big game hunting and, and there you go. People don't wanna be considered scavengers and gatherers. They wanna be big game hunters. But the evidence is that people were here before, uh, before the, the artifacts of Clovis and a lot of the Clovis artifacts or Clovis style artifacts were probably made in the Americas themselves. And so again, going with that, the prioritization of coastal routes, at least for the, some of the initial spread, as Raf says, there's a, there's a genetic uh, branching off at the, in the north, and then there's almost, almost an instantaneous, that's too big a word for it, a, a very rapid spread uh, that, of peoples into the, not instantaneous, you know, rapid by you know, a thousand years or so. So moving quite quickly into the coast and then into various land areas, and, and settling in and developing uh, a, a number of techniques to, to deal with things. So it is really exciting research and it's also exciting because uh, people are, are, I think in some ways, finally acknowledging that people need to be, uh, need to be taken seriously for their own issues. Um, and we need to do science with, together with people who make up these populations. I also gave you an article today based on some stuff that is happening in the, or stuff that happened in, on the coast of Ecuador. Uh, and I think this article is uh, pretty easy to read and think about. Uh, it goes, I think, pretty well with our last article uh, on figurines, or our last work on figurines, uh, but takes us into a new uh, geographical area. So in the last class, we we're looking at figurines from the Ice Age, pre-agricultural stuff that was going on uh, from basically from France to Siberia. These are uh, clay sculptures from the Ecuadorian coast. It's the longest, as, uh, as uh, Maria Fernanda Ugalde puts it, it is the longest uh, tradition of figurines, continuous figurine making uh, in the Americas that we know. And some of these we'll be talking in the next class about uh, plant and animal domestication and some various political uh, forms that arise from that. So some of these figurines are coming out uh, from, from the, what we may consider the post-agricultural period. And she makes some interesting, uh, it's an interesting analysis of how uh, some of those political transformations may have led to or been uh, linked to different changes in the figurines themselves. So what once were fairly ambiguous and fluid figurines can at different points become more idealized, more solidified as certain types. Uh, maybe people were, 
uh, developing different forms of, of, of gender hierarchy at the time. Um, but it's a good example, again, of how to try and get out of our own contemporary framework when we are looking back at the past um, in, I guess I would say, both ways. You don't want to, to export uh, our own gender hierarchies and gender binaries into the past, but you also don't want to pretend that people were, uh, were more fluid than they perhaps were. So this gives us a good sense of, uh, of what was going on in the, of some of the things that were going on in the Americas. As in the next class, we'll go into starting to think about what these populations in various parts of the world started to do with the plants and the animals that were, that were around them and transformed the environments in which they lived.